Around the world, stories have appeared claiming that dogs have the ability to literally sniff out cancer. If this is true, what are these dogs smelling? And what can our canine friends teach us about cancer detection? Today, I would like to talk about how nanosensors are bringing us one step closer to defeating cancer. But before I dive into the science of sniffing out cancer, I'd like to discuss how cancer is affecting us today. How many of you here have been affected by cancer or know someone that has been affected by cancer by a show of hands? Look around. That is the vast majority of the people here. According to the American Cancer Society, one out of every two men and one out of every three women will be affected by cancer sometime in their life. Some of you might have a higher or lower risk depending on certain factors such as whether you smoke or your family history or your age, just to name a few. In 2014, an estimated 1.66 million new cases of cancer are expected and as well as over half a million cancer-related deaths. That's equivalent to 1,600 cancer-related deaths every single day. As mentioned before, many factors affect your chances of getting and surviving cancer. One of, the biggest, one of the biggest variables affecting your survival is what stage was the cancer diagnosed at. Here we'll be looking at four cancers and their survival rates five years after their diagnosis. The three stages are localized cancer, shown in blue, which is the earliest stage, regional cancer, which is shown in red, and distant cancer, which is shown in green, and is also known as late stage cancer. In breast cancer, there was a 99% survival rate when it was localized, but only an 84% survival rate in regional, and only a 24% survival rate when it's distant. In melanoma, there's a 98% survival rate for local. In regional, it comes down to 62%. And in distant, only 16% survive. In colorectal cancer, 90% for localized, 70% for regional, and only 13% for distant. And finally, in prostate cancer, there are 100% of those with localized prostate cancer survive. 100% of those with regional prostate cancer survive, but only 28% of those with distant prostate cancer survive. This pattern is found in all cancers. The earlier we catch the cancer, the better your chances of surviving. It's as simple as that. But unfortunately, the early cancer detection methods today are inefficient and costly. There are many limitations to the current bioimaging techniques. X-rays, computerized tomography, and positron emission tomography all involve radiation. Including the MRI, these four bioimaging techniques have need a tumor consisting of several billion cancer cells at best. They're not efficient in detecting cancers that do not form solid tumors, such as in blood cancers like leukemia and lymphoma. These four bioimaging techniques, for example, if a lung cancer was based on one of these bioimaging techniques, a tissue sample is required to confirm the diagnosis and determine the type of cancer. Sputum cytology, bronchoscopies, and needle biopsies are all ways to do this, but these procedures can be inaccurate and painful. I have the privilege of working with my friend and mentor, Professor Hassan Hayek. He's a professor in the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. He's an expert in the fields of nanotechnology, nanosensors, and non-invasive disease diagnosis. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Marie Curie Excellence Award, the FP7 Health Award, and the Discovery Award of Bill and Melinda Gates. I'm also working with Haitha Mehmed, uh, Roy Farfara, and Ofra Nativ, and I will be referring to them as my team from now on. I will also be using the abbreviation VOC, which stands for Volatile Organic Compound, which is simply a group of chemicals that have carbon and are gases at room temperature. We had two objectives in this research. Firstly, we didn't know if there were changes in, in the human breath when cancer is present. And secondly, if there are changes, we needed a way to diagnose, we needed a way to detect these changes 
uh, in a manner that is practical in a doctor's office. I've created a small demonstration to show you the challenges we had to face. How many of you here can find all three of the four leaf clovers in this picture? It's not that easy. But what if you had a special lens that would filter out all the three leaf clovers and make the four leaf clovers stand out, like this? It's much easier to see the four leaf clovers now. This was the challenge we had to face. But instead of clovers, we had VOCs. And instead of trying to find the four leaf clovers, we had to find the changes in the human breath. So what did we do? Well, first we collected breath samples from healthy individuals all over the world. And we analyzed them using gas chromatography and mass spectrometry, which are standard chemical identification techniques. We found over 100 VOCs are present in a normal human's breath. We then took samples of patients that were already diagnosed with cancer and or various other diseases. And we found that there were changes in the chemical composition of the human breath. In lung cancer patients, shown in red, we see an increase in VOC2 versus healthy patients represented by the circles. This makes VOC2 extremely important for us to detect lung cancer in the human breath. For colorectal cancer, we see a decrease of VOC11 versus healthy patients. In breast cancer, we also see a decrease in VOC11. And in prostate cancer, we see an increase in VOC2 and a decrease in VOC11. What does this mean? This means that we can differentiate between healthy patients and patients that have cancer. But we need to take it a step further. We also need to differentiate between the different types of cancer. This is an illustration comparing nine VOCs between four different cancers. The, the thicker the line, the more abundant the VOC. As you can see here, in some cancers, there's higher or lower prevalence of VOCs, and, and some VOCs are completely missing in other cancers. This gives each cancer a unique fingerprint, or in this case, a breath print, that we can use to differentiate between the types of cancer. Even further, we can differentiate between the different subcategories and stages of the same cancer. Here we see the difference between benign and malignant lung cancer. Here the difference between early and advanced stage lung cancer. And here between the two different types of non-small cell lung cancers, which is adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinomas. With sensitivities and specificities in the high 80s and low 90s, we can detect, we can differentiate between these different types of lung cancer with a high accuracy and a low incidence of false positives and false negatives. So now that we know that there are changes in the human breath when disease is present, how can we detect these changes quickly, easily, and accurately? Nanosensors are the answer. I'd like to take a minute to discuss how these nanosensors work, and I'll try to simplify it as much as I can. This is a magnified schematic of a nanosensor. On each side, we have an electrode, one positive, one negative, shown in pink. In between these two electrodes is a layer of gold nanoparticles. Gold, being a good conductor of electricity, will allow the electrons to move from one side to the other. The characteristics of the gold layer determine how easily these electrons flow from one electrode to the other. This is also known as resistance. On top of the gold layer, we have another layer of chemicals called ligands. Ligands are chemicals that attach to a specific group of compounds. When a VOC attaches to a matching ligand, changes occur in the gold layer. The gold nanoparticles either separate away from each other, decreasing the resistance, or come closer to each other, increasing the resistance. We measure the changes in, in the resistance, and we translate the data to identify the chemical that touched the nanosensor. When in, in the development of nanosensors, there, the issue of reproducibility arises. So we take we do certain techniques uh, to ensure that each nanosensor performs as expected. First, we make the nanosensors in batches to ensure each one is made exactly the same way, and then we inspect the nanosensors using digital multimeters and light microscopes. We then place the nanosensors in a vacuum oven to ensure that they're stable over long, over long periods of time. We then take the nanosensors and put them in the nanos. 
The nano artificial nose, or nanos for short, is a device that encompasses an array of nanosensors, each coated with a different ligand layer. My team and I have created a small uh, animation to show you how it works. VOCs, or volatile organic compounds, are released from the cancer cells, where they eventually end up in the bloodstream. In the, blood, in the bloodstream, they eventually travel to the lungs, where they are exhaled in very small quantities. When the exhaled breath enters the nanos, the, nanos, uh, the nanosensors are exposed to the breath sample. As I said previously, each nanos is coated with a different ligand. So only when a matching chemical touches the ligand layer, the nanosensor is able to identify the, the chemical, and using that information, it's able to detect the, the location of the cancer, the stage of the cancer, and the type of cancer. And it's able to do this relatively early in, in the cancer stages. We are also tailoring the nanos to detect diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, as well as cardiovascular, pulmonary, and even infectious diseases. The nanos we hope one day the nanos will uh, be in every doctor's office. It will empower physicians to give us a fair chance against cancer. In third world countries, the nanos will, give, will be a valuable tool in preventing disease outbreak and will also allow us to spread resources and aid to those who need it the most. I'm a pre-med student here at the University of Central Florida. And I joined this research about a year ago. Uh, I wanted to gain some research experience and, and see how the world of scientific research is. And needless to say, I came out with a lot more than that. I learned that research isn't just about answering a question. It's a lot more personal than that. It's about understanding the world around us and using that understanding to better mankind. This research has given me the chance to dream. Dream about the day where cancer no longer makes us feel hopeless, where cancer no longer means a dead end. The day we beat cancer is closer than ever. And so, while you stop and smell the roses, just remember how much a puff of air can tell us. Thank you.